ideologie die moet worden tegengegaan, verzoekt de regerende islam zoveel mogelijk uit Nederland te bannen en gaat over tot de orde van de dag. Ja. Okay. Like people don't watch like really long videos, so it's shorter than that. And okay. uh, mashallah, so we can make it into like sound bites. Or I can just say become Muslim. Why not? And <laughs> just get it done with you. Yeah. <laughs> Five it. second interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just the short version. <laughs> okay, Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'ina ma'bat. And I greet and welcome all of you with the Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace and mercy and guidance be upon all of you. Today I have a really important guest, a really special guest, an amazing guest with an amazing story. Brother Yoram, welcome to the show. How are you, brother? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, wa alaikum salam. Uh, thank you very much. I'm fine. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing good. Uh, you know, when I read your story, when I watched your videos, one person in history I was reminded of, and that person was Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Before he converted to Islam, before Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu converted to Islam, he had many anti-Islamic feelings, anti-prophetic feelings, and then he had a change of heart. And then he made the best decision of his life. He submitted to Allah by reciting, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But before your conversion, we just wanted to find out, you know, the friends that you had, the colleagues that you had, did you have any touch with any Muslims around your area, your neighbors, uh, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, I had uh, actually a very good friend of mine was, uh, was a Muslim, two of them even. Nice. So it, it wasn't that I didn't know any Muslims at all. But um, yeah, I, I always separated it. I made a, uh, like, like a distinction between Islam and the people. And I always thought, well, th those are, of course, are nice people, otherwise they wouldn't become uh, my friends back then. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I thought, well, uh, it's despite the fact that they uh, have a Muslim background, of course, because Islam, in my view, back then was horrible. So you were thinking, you know what, Islam is really bad, but they are some good Muslims, you know, just like they're followers of any faith, they're good and the bad. And yeah. you were thinking, you know, my, these two friends are good people, good Muslims in spite yeah. of Islam, in spite of their faith. Yes, that's it. So obviously, you know, when you mentioned that you had anti-Islamic feelings, I mean, is it because of the way that you were brought up? Or is it because of what you may have been seeing and watching in, in the media? So why did you have so much hatred about Islam in the past? Yeah, I think there are three points there. Uh, the first is my uh, upbringing. I was uh, brought up in a very conservative Protestant environment. And it's not so much that my parents taught me to hate Muslims or hate Islam or whatever, but it's the theology and the things you learn in church or when you're reading books of your own ministers and stuff like that. And they were very uh, negative when it, uh, when it was about other religions and uh, especially Islam, because in a historical sense, of course, it was kind of uh, a competition between Christianity and Islam. Uh, when you look at Europe, especially, or Northern Africa, uh, so that's something that was in the string of my denomination of Christianity. It was still very alive, very much alive. So that was one thing. Uh, the other thing is that it's also cultural. Because, uh, because of the clashes there have been between Islam, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and Christianity in Europe, uh, a lot of European people feel very negative about Islam. Because they say, well, uh, especially when you look at Eastern Europe, there have been a lot of colonies. Uh, they were uh, colonized by the Turkish people, by the Ottoman Empire. So uh, they have very anti-Turkish feelings. And uh, back then they uh, said, well, Turkish are Muslims, so that's the same. They are Islam. So that's something that's very deep in culture. For example, you have the croissant, you know, the, the bread you can eat. Mm -hmm. that's, it was invented in Austria in 1683 when there was the Battle of Vienna. And the Christians uh, won. They... Uh, they were able to uh, prevent uh, the Turkish people, the Ottoman Empire, to take over Vienna. And to celebrate it, they made a little bread in the shape of a half moon, a crescent moon. And they ate it to humiliate the other ones. But it's still around. And of course, nobody thinks about a croissant in that way. But it's just to show that the anti-Islamic feelings are very deep in European culture. And the third thing is, of course, uh, terrorism and uh, yeah, the, the, 
the stuff that happened uh, over the last 10, 12 years in, uh, in Europe because my first day at uh, the university was uh, remarkably uh, September 11, 2001. And Theo van Gogh was a, a famous uh, filmmaker in the Netherlands who was uh, slaughtered in the street, was near my own house. Uh, so the combination of those factors made me very anti-Islam. But that is understood that if a person does not have the right uh, perspective of Islam, if nobody may have taught that person, you know what, these are the actions of some people, but these are the realities of Islam. So it, is, it can be really understood from the Muslim perspective. Why would a person have these kind of feelings? You know, so it's so much important, and we can discuss this later, that how it is so important for the Muslims to step up to the plate and to let our fellow humans know that this is what Islam is. And let's have a distinction between the actions of the people and the true and the beautiful teachings of Islam. Did your friends did any dawah to you, sharing their message to you? Well, of course, I was in university and I studied comparative religion. So it wasn't that I didn't know anything about Islam. Uh, the point was that I was uh, uh, a practicing Christian. So everything I heard and learned about Islam was filtered through my Christian glasses. Yes. So that's how I looked at the world. And uh, of course, uh, uh, what I said, they were very nice people and they did a lot of uh, good things. And uh, we went eating together and uh, do uh, fun, fun stuff. But uh, they were never able to convince me because uh, I, I always had an answer for them. They said, well, but look at this, look at that. Uh, so it was very hard. It was like I had a shield. So they couldn't penetrate the shield. I see, I see. But you know, if Allah wants to guide a person, doesn't matter how hard the shield is, how thick oh. the shield is. Alhamdulillah, Allah has his beautiful ways. Then you joined some political party, right? This was a famous party in uh, your country, Netherlands. No, I was uh, very much convinced of the fact that Islam was the biggest uh, threat to world peace. So I thought to myself when I uh, uh, finished my, um, uh, my university uh, education, I thought, well, what can I do now? And I start teaching. So I was a teacher. And uh, after that, I thought, well, that's not enough. I cannot uh, educate people alone. I have to change the world. <laughs> I was young, of course, and a little... <laughs> Uh, but uh, and then I thought well what's the most anti-Islamic party in the Netherlands and that will be the party I joined and it was of course the Freedom Party of Geert Wilders so I wrote him a letter and I said well if I can do anything for you just let me know and he wrote back that's how it began I see I see and you were part of that party for about what a few years a few months no, uh, in, um, when I look at the first letter I, I, I sent in, it was 2005, and I stayed there till 2014. So altogether, I think nine years. But in the, in the meantime, I was uh, also um, a member of uh, the city council for another political party, a right-wing party as well, but they were like uh, Freedom Party light. Uh, but uh, I, I, in the end, I was I was working for them, and I said, "Well, you're not you're not real anti-Islam. I need the real deal." <laughs> and so, and then I joined uh, Wilders, and I became a member of Parliament as well. And I've been in Parliament uh, for uh, almost eight years. That's quite long uh, time to commit to a party because of the intention that you had, the passion that you may have. In a word, yeah. Islam and Muslims. Let me defeat them using this platform of this party. Yes. Yeah, because and I, I went into politics because I thought, well, what can we do? How can you change it in, in, the, in the fastest and strongest way? That's by changing the law. Of course, of course. And I wanted to forbid, of course, uh, uh, Islamic schools in the Netherlands. I tried to ban the Quran from the Netherlands, immigration from Islamic countries, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. Everything uh, to... to uh, prohibits Islam. So we always hear the news from the Netherlands that Muslims cannot uh, practice freely, they cannot build the minarets. There is something that happened in the past, what was it? Some limitation or restriction to the freedom of Muslims? Well, uh, in fact, it was an uh, initiative of mine. Oh. <laughs> I try. <laughs> this, uh, that's uh, real sick. Uh, but uh, what I tried to do was uh, make sure there was a ban on building minarets. Hmm. And they were uh, the prime minister talked about it, and they they uh, 
they said in the end, of course, we won't do that because of freedom of religion and it's in our constitution. But there was a real discussion and it was a discussion that lasted for uh, almost a year. But in the end, they didn't do it. So you can still build a minaret, you can still build mosques. But uh, because of my uh, old party, Freedom Party was part of parliament, but also part of the government. Uh, they were able to change some things. And uh, we had a, a list with wishes. And one of those wishes was uh, uh, to stop people from building minarets, mosques, Islamic schools. So that's why it became so much news. Uh, but in the end, it didn't change too much. Alhamdulillah, Thank right? You. Alhamdulillah. Allah has his own ways. You know, people make plans, but Allah is the best of all planets. <laughs> so your intention was to ultimately ban Islam from Netherlands. The Quran, yeah. the mosques, massages, practicing of Muslims, all of them, that was the intention, I guess. You want yeah, to finish up Islam from the country. Everything, yeah. And uh, that one thing was, uh, in one, way, one thing we were successful, normally in, when you look, come to the Dutch parliament, there was a Bible and there was a Quran and there was a Torah in, in parliament, in the middle of parliament, um, next to the seat of the chairman. But uh, because uh, our, uh, my old party said, well, we don't want to have a Quran in parliament. So we, that, that's unthinkable. How can we have such an, a book, the central book of such an ideology in our parliament? So they banned the Quran from parliament. Mm -hmm. But then there was a very secular party said, well, then we have to ban the Bible as well. So there are no religious books in the Dutch parliament anymore now. So it's a, it's a, it's a sad thing. But uh, yeah, what can you do now? So this was the religion, uh, the Freedom Party, right? Yeah. How can it be Freedom Party when you are not giving freedom to people? <laughs> yeah. I was trying to think of that. <laughs> yeah, that's a question that, uh, that was asked a lot, <laughs> of course. Yeah, I mean. yeah. But they said, well, true freedom is, uh, is a world without Islam. That was the, 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 the answer we always gave. You know, true freedom in Islam is Chapter number two, Surah Baqarah, ayah number 256. Allah says, La deen. There is no yeah. compulsion in faith. Give people a choice. Obviously, with a smile, convey to them, with your good words, with your good actions, the message. If yeah. they don't embrace, it's up to them, between them and Allah. Right? Yeah. The choice, the true freedom Islam gives to people. Yeah, I know now, <laughs> but I didn't know back then. And, uh, and the Freedom Party isn't about the freedom at all. It's, yeah, it's, it's all about uh, banning Islam. Which is well understood now. So then you, then you got out of the party. Why? 2014. If that was the yeah. intention to have a spokesperson against Islam using the party, why leave the party? Yeah, uh, that was because uh, the... the the boss, uh, Geert Wilders, mm -hmm. uh, he had a, a, a rant in an, um, in an event uh, because of, and it was because of um, elections for the city council. So it wasn't uh, elections for parliament, but for the city council. But he had to draw some attention to his own party because the pollings weren't that too good uh, to, to, uh, uh, to win uh, the election. So what he did was... Uh, going to extreme and he started uh, asking people who were at uh, the gathering do you want more or less Moroccans in the Netherlands and because Moroccans of course most of them 99% are Muslims uh, the question was do you want more or less Muslims in the Netherlands and then everybody starts shouting less 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 and it was because uh, yeah, it looked like they, he was getting those people ex excited to uh, remove those people from the Netherlands. Of course, that's, that wasn't what he said, but that was the feeling that a lot of people got when they were looking at the television and, and listening to the radio. Uh, and it was the feeling I had uh, myself. <laughs> and I said, well, I am very anti-Islam back then, uh, and I wanted to ban Islam from the Netherlands. But I said, well, you cannot ban all people because there are as I knew because of my old friends, uh, the friends before I went anti-Islam were Muslims as well. There are good people. And even when I was anti-Islam, uh, there were people with Moroccan descent working in the Freedom Party as well. They were very secular atheists, but they were Moroccan as well. So I thought, well, do we have to remove those people as well? It wasn't, not, it wasn't logical anymore. I thought, well, I'm not a racist in a classical sense. So I said, well, 
I can't, I can't stay here anymore. So that's uh, the moment I left the party. Then you started to write a book about Islam or against Islam. Tell us. Yeah, uh, in 2014, I was still in parliament. I left the party, but I was still in parliament. So we got our own little uh, party. <laughs> and okay. we were still, we were still anti-Islam, uh, uh, but not, not so much as the Freedom Party. Uh, and I was starting to write my book, and my book was a very anti-Islam book. And what I wanted to do was all the things I said and all the things I've done when it comes to the, the, uh, the legal, in the legal sense, um, I wanted to uh, make sure that the discussion that was uh, uh, was there in, in media and stuff like that, to make sure that everybody understood why do you have to be anti-Islam to be pro-freedom. And I said, well, I have to write a book so everybody knows why Islam is a danger. And that's when I started writing the book. But because of the fact that I was still in parliament, I had too much time to write. So in, when I left parliament, it was uh, four years later, three and a half years later. Then I started, well, I said, okay, now I have the time to write the book. It was a long-held desire. So I started writing the book, the anti-Islam book. But when I was writing the book, I started with, uh, with books. I had a lot of books here in the back. One of the books <laughs> is called Endgame. And it was written by a professor, a Dutch professor, who was, he, he was also a member of the party, the Freedom Party. He was in the European Parliament. And he said, well, Islam is like cancer. So you have to cut it away. So that was the first book I, I used to write my book. Uh, the table of contents was already there, very negative, of course. But uh, when I was writing the book, I, I, was, um, I came across so many information. I was at odds with the things I already knew because of my study. But also, I got a lot of new books, uh, too. And I said, well, there are two versions almost of Islam, this one and that one. And that doesn't, didn't make any sense. So in the end, uh, I started writing to several religious authorities. And one of the people I uh, wrote to was Abdul Hakim Murad, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad from Cambridge yeah. University. And I thought, well, the guy will never write back because I put a little Wikipedia uh, link in my letter because I wanted to be uh, fair and honest so he would know who was writing him. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I thought, well, he, he will never answer. But uh, it took a couple of weeks, but in the end, he wrote back. It was very extensive, and he answered all my questions. Mm. And he said, well, you have to look at that book. You have to look at this book. That's not the context. This is the context. And we start writing to each other. So I, I wrote him questions. He gave me answers. He gave me names. He gave me books. He gave me a lot of information. And in the end, I started uh, noticing that my heart was changing. And I was so... Uh, what I said and did wasn't, wasn't, wasn't true and it wasn't, it wasn't factual. So that was the moment that, that uh, I started changing my views on Islam in, in a little way because I was still anti-Islam, of course, because it was part of my being almost. Brother Abdul Hakim Murad, he's also a convert to Islam, correct? He, yeah. also, he also embraced Islam from Germany? No, he's from, uh, his name is Tim Winter. He's from uh, England. He's a British guy. He's a professor at Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, uh, he's teaching uh, Arabic and Islam uh, at, at Cambridge, but he converted uh, back in the 70s. I already had some doubts about Christian faith, and that's mm -hmm. something I had when I was about 16, 17 years old. You start questioning, uh, questioning things about your own religion, of course, like all people do, and it's, that's normal. But there were uh, a few questions that were very harsh for me uh, to answer, and uh, one of them was the Trinity of Christ, uh, God, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit, of course. Uh, God is three in, in Christianity. Uh, the sacrifice of Christ, why... Uh, do we have to see someone die before God can forgive? And it was very strange because in the Old Testament, part one of the Bible, so to say, there's a, a passage that says, well, nobody uh, dies or will die for the sins of another. And I thought, well, that's exactly what Christianity teaches us. Someone had to die for my sins. And the third thing was original sin. And that's when you take it, uh, when you look at the theology, and that's what I did uh, during uh, college, of course, you see that in Catholic church, the first church, the mother church, as they say in Christianity, they say, well, everybody goes to hell if they don't accept Christ as their savior. But I think, well, that's a little bit strange because uh, people like Noah or Abraham or Adam, they didn't know Christ because there was no Christ. So I asked my minister back then, and I was 16, 17 years old. Yeah? Uh, I asked him, are they in hell? 
I said, no, of course not, of course not. How can you say that? It's almost blasphemy to, to say that. And I said, well, that, but that's, that's the logical uh, consequence when we say you have to embrace Christ as your savior, otherwise you go to hell. So those people didn't do that because there was no Christ. I said, well, okay, th there's another path as well. So I said, oh, that's not the only way then. I said, but that's what the Bible says. Right. So that's how my questions start popping up. But uh, in, uh, I was 16, 17 years old. So uh, I, in the end, I said, okay, maybe I don't understand it. That's okay. And I, I forgot it. But when I was writing my book, those questions popped up again. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I thought, and I saw the logical theology of Islam. One God, no sacrifice. People are responsible for their own, uh, for their own behavior, their own sins. Uh, and there was no original sin. So I said, well, and I find it very hard back then. I said, well, it's more logical and it, it, it it's, it's almost fits better with the way I think and how I feel about the world and the things I see than Christianity. So th those were uh, some questions that all uh, that were all in my mind when I was writing the book, asking the questions uh, when it came to writing Abdul Hakim Murat. And he said, well, what you have to do is step out of the barn. It's like you are in a barn in a garden and there's mm -hmm. a big, beautiful house in front of you that's islam and you have to get out of the barn with all the extremist views get out of the barn look into uh walk into the garden and look at the house and that's the house of islam then you go in pick a room and then you'll see when you are walking through the house what islam is but i see he said well you cannot um uh start yelling and start screaming and uh, do all the things you did from a little barn if you don't know uh, how to uh, understand the religion so that's how i he, he made me reread so then let's come to the final moment right alhamdulillah you were writing the book that is supposed to be an anti-islamic book and now this thoughts rush to your mind that maybe there is something true to islam and then what was the final straw that you you said you know what this is it leaving christianity leaving anti-islamic views and now I have to finally embrace the truth of Islam, the faith of Islam, and take the Shahada. How did that happen? Uh, it, was, uh, <laughs> it wasn't in one day. <laughs> okay, of course. Uh, uh, now, now what, what I uh, started doing was comparing Christianity to Islam. And I said, well, of course, we start with God. And how is God in Christianity? What's the concept of God in Islam? And I started comparing it, and I thought, what I told you earlier, I found it more logical in Islam. That was the first. Then I started uh, looking at the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because um, uh, the, the views I had and the perception I had when it comes when it uh, came to uh, uh, the Prophet were very negative, very very negative, and that's that's one of the the the, the core um, causes of that was that we learn. Uh, in the West, that Islam is uh, the religion of a false prophet. So they said, well, Islam is like a moon religion, and they uh, worship the moon. Uh, there were all arguments from the Middle Ages, but they are still in, in European culture. So that's what, what my perception was. It was almost like uh, Islam was a religion of the devil. And when I was writing the book, I started questioning, uh, uh, I started uh, writing about those questions, and I got so many answers and was so illogical uh, what I said and what I did and what a lot of people wrote in the past, that uh, all those objections vanished, that they disappeared because they were simply not true. And, uh, and then I said, okay, well, if it's not the religion of evil, uh, maybe there are some good things in it. Uh, then I have to look at the life of the prophet. And... Um, I was reading and reading, and in the end, there was a book of uh, Martin Lynx. Yes. It was about the, the, the earliest sources. And in, in that book, uh, there was a story about uh, Hint. Uh, and, I, and I thought, well, um, of course, uh, she, she paid uh, someone to kill the uncle of the prophet, and uh, he was m mutilated, ears cut off, nose cut off, the most horrible things happened. And of course, the prophet was very... Uh, very sad and, and he was uh, he's crying and a few years later he was in power and then he met her again and I was I was reading the part and I was I was reading I was suspecting from okay where's the part that she gets her head cut off or she mm -hmm. will die but it didn't happen 
so it, it was really, 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 and I was looking for for the the horrible end, but it didn't happen. And he said, "Well, welcome to Islam." Uh, as a matter of fact, and she turned Muslim as well, and he forgave her. And I thought, well, I can say whatever I want about this this person, but this is not evil. I, I cannot. It, it's uh, it, it's something good if you are able to forgive someone who did something. Uh, such so evil uh, it's it's almost like a, a heavenly uh, character that you're uh, showing to people uh, an example and uh, that that was the moment for me that I said well I think I was wrong and it was a very hard moment because it's all of course uh, ego as well you know the Quran says about Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him chapter 21 verse number 107 <laughs> That it, Allah is saying that He has not sent you, Muhammad, peace be upon Him, but as a mercy to humanity, as a mercy to all the creations. Right. So, this is just one story that you mentioned how He forgave even that person who did such a heinous act against His own uncle. But there are so many such instances. You know, one time as He entered Mecca, 10,000 people around Him. And he was faced by the same people who used to torture him and kick him out and took over the property of the Muslims and killed many Muslims. He faced those same individuals. He had the upper hand. And they asked him, or he asked them, what do you think I will do to you? And they said, you know what, you are our good brother. And then he said, today you are you're all forgiven. Look at this, right? I mean, we can just get so much inspiration. Sometimes we have these feelings of vengeance. They did this to us. Let me do the same thing. But look at the example of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And you gave a really good example about how Hind, what she did and how he forgave. And that truly is a change of heart for yeah. you, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of people in the West say, well, you have to compare uh, Jesus Christ with Muhammad, peace yeah. be upon him. Uh, but when I was writing the book, I uh, noticed that uh, they all, uh, all prophets, of course, had different tasks. And I said, well, it's, it's more logical to compare him to Moses. Because Moses was uh, a lawgiver. That's his name in, 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 uh, in Europe. Uh, Muhammad was a lawgiver, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, he had to establish a community, Moses. Well, Muhammad had to establish a community. He was sent for everybody. He was sent for everybody. So I said it was it was more like a Moses figure than a Jesus figure. And I said when when I, when I start comparing the 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 law they brought, uh, the, the law in in the Old Testament uh, in the Bible, uh, chapter one as as they say, uh, of, of part one, it's very harsh when you compare it to, for example, Sharia. When it comes to uh, for waging war and stuff like that, of course, war is never nice. But there were so many uh, rules uh, what not to do during war. When you look at the Islamic uh, concept, when you compare to the, the, the Jewish slash Christian concept, where they say, well, you have to wipe out the entire village. You even have to cut off, cut the trees, kill the animals, even kill all the babies. Yes. I said, well, when I compared it to Islam, they said, no, you cannot. Uh, cut a tree, you don't fight to people who don't fight you, leave the women alone, leave the babies alone, leave the children alone. I said, wow, that's so much more human. Of course, of course. You know, so that passage, Brother Yoram, is in Old Testament, in the first book of Samuel's, chapter 15, verse number 3. So basically, God of the Bible is mentioning to one of the leaders of the military and saying to that person that go to the Amicalites, attack yeah. the Amicalites, totally destroy them, the men, the women, the children, the infants, right? The camel, the animals, the donkey, every life, just wipe it off. Yeah. And I say to my non-Muslim, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, you will never find a passage like that in the entire Quran. Oh, you okay. will never find a passage like that from the sayings and the words and the example from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In fact, the Quran says that taking the life of an innocent person is like taking the life of all of humanity, right? Chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 32. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he had to face so many offensive uh, or defensive battles, he actually mentioned to the people, to the soldiers, his companions, that even in a war, do not kill women and children. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, amazing. 
so then lead us towards the conversion process mashallah right yeah yeah of course and uh, um uh, after after um realizing those truths <laughs> truths <laughs> sorry um it's uh, yeah, yeah it was it was it was a choice yeah to make is it is it something you will keep to yourself in your heart or will you act on it and uh, i told my mother and uh, she she said, she said to me well you can be a muslim in in silence <laughs> so you don't have to to tell people uh, and then i i told her well of course that's that's a that's a possibility but that's something that it, it won't be practical because when you really believe something you want to talk about it you want to act upon it you want to do something with it uh, and i told her if you go uh, to church uh, you do that with a reason and when you are a christian you want to go to church because you want to hear about uh, stuff they uh, tell you in church uh, and i told her well if if you are a christian i tell you well you cannot go to church or you cannot read a bible you cannot that, that that's ridiculous i said well yeah that is <laughs> so I, I i i i said to myself then i have to act upon it and if i want to be a muslim then i have to people uh, i have to let people know because i was so extremely anti islam anti muslim so the only thing i can do is explain myself uh, to the people and what i found out and what i did and what why i had a change of mind and a change of heart um and then i uh, got to some people uh, one of them was my um, publisher <laughs> of the book because it was a funny story as well it's a little side way but uh, i was looking for uh, when i was writing my anti islam book i was looking for a very dutch uh publisher and the name of the islamic publisher because it's an islamic publisher is in dutch it's called a kennis house and it means house of knowledge mm -hmm. but it was written in old dutch so it's it's uh, you have uh, to it's like arabic you have classical arabic and uh, modern and and they write it in a classical way and I said whoa that, and that's something that a lot of right wing people do so okay, that's that's the publisher for me because they know a lot about islam because i saw some titles and they are very strong dutch but in the end, they uh, yeah. When I when I met the publisher, he said, "Well, yeah." I said, "Well, you look like a Muslim." He said, "Yeah, I am a Muslim." Really? <laughs> it was very funny. Yeah. So he said, "Well, there's the hand of God," <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, maybe the hand of Google." <laughs> and he said, well, "All <laughs> Google also <laughs> gets uh, is is of course uh, um, uh, under uh, the reign of God." <laughs> so that's a uh, that's a little sideline, but. Um, yeah, uh, I, I converted uh, with uh, with with the publisher with me and to uh, one imam, uh, two imams, uh, and it wasn't like there was there were all uh, uh, golden uh, golden clouds and rainbows and stuff like that. But it feel it felt very calming, and I was very at peace at the moment that uh, that it happened. So I was very uh, yeah very happy. So you went to the masjid, the closest masjid. No, it was no, it wasn't in a masjid. It was in the house of the publisher, because oh, okay. I, yeah, because I still was a little bit, uh, yeah, I, I would say, like like shy. <laughs> um, and he said, "Well, we can do it in my house. It's no problem." Change the book to be a Islamic book, right? What what is the title of the book? If our viewers want to look at it, see it, and purchase it, right? What is the title yeah, of the well, book? I, I here maybe you can. I don't know if it's possible to see it. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's called Apostate. A past state, okay. Oh, you have Pass, something yeah. brown on your head. <laughs> no, no, that, that's a coincidence. Here, it's it's just the light. It wasn't a mask. Oh, it's the light. It's, okay. <laughs> I thought no, you were wearing a king's crown, right? Your arm, king's crown. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not that. <laughs> no, no. So anyone no, no, can purchase good. this on um, what Amazon.com, perhaps? Yeah, you can find it on Amazon. So uh, it's it's there. And it's translated into English, and it's nice because it's the foreword of uh, Shai Hamza Yusuf mm -hmm. and uh, Shai Abdul Hakim Murad. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, I was very uh, honored that they uh, were willing to write a foreword uh, to the book. But I changed the, I changed the, yeah, the, the title was uh, Apostle, of course, and it was a funny thing. Uh, <laughs> Shai Hamza Yusuf, I, I talked to him last year, and he told me, well, if you translate it into Urdu, and you want to publish it in uh, in Pakistan? He said yeah. you have to change you have to change the title because you <laughs> otherwise you have a problem. I know, I know. 
Just the word itself. Was a joke, scary. of course. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because the word apostate, it has so many negative connotations to it. How did your mom feel about not just the conversion, but also about the book? Um, well, in, in the beginning, the first time I told her, she cried because uh, she didn't like uh, the fact that uh, I became a Muslim. And she said, well, you, uh, you, you always have to be so extreme. Because, of course, when I, when I became anti-Islam, uh, she, she didn't like Islam, but she wasn't anti-Islam like I was. She was, uh, 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 yeah, how do you say it, a normal practicing Christian woman. She didn't do too much and, and she didn't hate Islam or, or something like that. But she didn't, she just disliked it in a light way. <laughs> if right. you, if something. But uh, when I told her, well, uh, I'm a Muslim now, she, she really, uh, yeah, she really was sad and uh, she told me that, um, yeah, of course, I was still her son. But, uh, yeah, that, that she really had problems with it. More than I taught her that she would have uh, with me becoming a Muslim. Yeah. But uh, later on, uh, I think uh, a year or something later, she told me, well, I, I think you're uh, sweeter as, uh, as a Muslim than as a Christian. So it was a very really? <laughs> nice thing to say. And she said, I still don't like the fact that you became a Muslim. <laughs> but when I look at you, <laughs> uh, your behavior changed in a positive way. So there was a, yeah, it's an encouraging. <laughs> no, mashallah, that's a really amazing remark for our, especially our mom, our dad, our family to say. Right. Uh, you know, as I always say, for any person who converts or reverse, that, you know, we, we should become even a better son to our parents a better brother to our siblings and a better neighbor, a better human. And mashallah, you are exemplifying that. And I hope and pray that, you know, one day, inshallah, very soon, your mother, your parents, your family, your relatives, and all humanity, inshallah, by your influence, right, good behavior, by you being a better son, also looks into Islam and with Allah's guidance, we cannot change the hearts and minds of people with Allah's guidance that she also looks into Islam and inshallah take that important step as you have taken by reciting La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I would recommend and encourage all the viewers who are watching this to do likewise for Brother Yoram's uh, parents and especially your mom. So Brother Yoram, lastly, what message that you would have to those people who may be in the same boat as you were yeah, it's. Uh, I think that uh, the most important thing is uh, in the end knowledge. Mm -hmm. So make sure that when you talk about something, that you know what you are talking about, and and not um, uh, by listening to people who are also anti-Islam, but um, by uh, I don't, uh, by by uh, searching for the truth in Islamic sources. So that's something that's very important for people who are um, very anti-Islam to make sure that your, your facts are straight. And maybe you can talk to uh, a Muslim who has some knowledge to verify the things you say. Is it correct? Why uh, do I think it's like that? And, and that's something, and of course, and that's something more for the Islamic community. Is uh, uh, there's a, a saying in a hadith? And, uh, forgive me my, my bad Arabic, but I think it's something like uh, Yasiru walatu asul, wa bashiru walati nafiru. Uh, so that that is the, the, the message uh, spread and uh, spread the message in a, in a good way and and don't scare people away from Islam. And that's something. Uh, it's uh, very uh, nice that you, you mentioned it because the the behavior of a lot of people who call themselves Muslims sometimes isn't that Islamic. So uh, if if you don't know anything about Islam and there is one guy or one woman in um, in in uh, in in your family or in your street and he is behaving very badly in a negative way and that that's the only thing people will see about Islam then so they say okay that is Islam uh, the guy over there is a Muslim he's behaving very bad that's it and of course you have all the problems. Uh, like the, the history, uh, maybe uh, a Christian family who is very anti-Islam and stuff like that. So it culminates and then they say, well, this, this is Islam. Uh, so it's, it's, I think it's very big responsibility, of course, of Muslims because sometimes, and it's not always nice, but you are like a, a cart of the religion. People look at you, you are the example. And uh, of course, uh, the example uh, that we all have 
uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, so peace be upon him, yes. gave, gave people another example than we see nowadays, uh, unfortunately, of a lot of people. And I think that's, that's the best thing. He's, they say, well, he was the Quran. So if people are not willing to read the Quran, show them Quran. Did a really important message on WhatsApp. It said that non-Muslims may not read the Quran, but they read you. Yeah, that's it. Your behavior. It. So you are a spokesperson regardless if you want it to be or not. When yeah. they know that you are a Muslim, people judge Islam by who you are. Important passage in the Quran, in chapter 16, verse number 125, where Allah, God, is saying to humanity, to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and through him to all of humanity, and the verse continues. So the translation is, invite all to the way of Allah with wisdom and good preaching. Means yeah. with a smile, compassion, empathy. And converse with them in ways which are best and most gracious. You know, mashallah, you are doing dawah, right? Dawa campaigns and dawa activities that you're involved in. You know, I would like to get inspired. Muslims would like to get inspired, mashallah. What are you doing nowadays? Um, well, uh, what we do, it's, and we're still developing, uh, developing uh, the project, is that we, uh, we ordered some VR glasses, mm -hmm. and, uh, 25. And what we do is that we show them the history of uh, Islam. In a positive way so uh, and what we do is that we go to schools to prisons and uh, all places where there are young people especially young people uh, and we want to influence them in a, in a positive way so that the first thing they will uh, remember when it comes to islam is something positive because there will be a lot of negative negativity in media etc etc but they will always have that first positive uh, memory of Islam when they had our VR experience and uh, that's, that's something we're developing now and it, it's looking very uh, very sharp and it's, uh, very professional so I'm very excited and enthusiastic uh, about it. That's quite creative, that's quite creative. So mashallah you can take it out in different languages, you can build a series of different uh, aspects of Islam, Quran, yeah. Prophet's life, misconceptions, maybe a tour of the masjid, the possibilities yeah. are unlimited, yeah, sure, right? right? And I and I pray for the success of this project. Maybe inshallah we can exchange resources. Yeah, yeah. okay, of course. Yeah, we're all in the same boat. We want to please yeah. Allah, connect humanity with the Creator, and do good deeds. And we hope and pray that may Allah accept it from all of us. So, brother Yoram, you know your story is amazing. I pray that may Allah give you and all of us the ability to learn more about Islam to practice Islam, to become spokesperson of Islam, to follow the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in sharing the message of Islam with all of humanity. You know, I really appreciate your time. I really admire your story. And I hope and pray that may Allah keep you guided, keep all of us guided, and make, make all of us ambassadors of Islam. Ameen. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. It was, a, it was a, a great honor for me to be on your show. You're a very famous person, of course. And uh, yeah, I, I hope it helps and uh, that, uh, that we can spread the message uh, uh, with this uh, interview as well. Alhamdulillah. May Allah accept it from all of us. Jazakallah khair, brother Yoram. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May Allah's peace be upon you, brother. Thank you, Salam. Alhamdulillah.